Today on the Matt Wall Show, Goodyear was exposed for its discriminatory policy allowing Black Lives Matter but not All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. Uh, the media has rushed to the company's defense, but leaked audio now shows that the policy is even worse than we thought. We'll talk about that and I'll play the audio. Also, five headlines, including a stirring speech from a pop star at the DNC convention last night. And in our daily cancellation, we'll discuss the vile left-wing mob that randomly destroyed a man's life because of an innocent typo in a tweet. All of that and a lot more on the way. Pack show today. But first, I'm truly excited to tell you about a new sponsor on the show called Charity Mobile. Honestly, you know, you couldn't ask for a better transition here. Uh, it, it really works out because I think today, especially, we're all thinking, you know, that we'd like to find companies that support our values. Well, they are out there, believe it or not. And when you find them, you got to support them. We can't just see them and say, oh, hey, guys, great. Thumbs up. Good job. But uh, and then not support them. No, it's up to us to support the companies that support us. And that's what uh, Charity Mobile is all about. Charity Mobile is the pro-life phone company. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice. Um, that to me is, is the headline, but there's a lot more to it than that. New activations and eligible accounts get a free cell phone with free activation and free shipping. Credit check required. Restrictions apply on that. Listen, uh, there are no contracts. There are no termination fees. No risk with a 30-day guarantee, and you'll get uh, the live customer service based in the USA as well to help you out if you need it. And I've dealt with these guys over at Charity Mobile, and they're great. Really nice, helpful, uh, living up to the to the name, I would say. The way I look at it is uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I love Charity Mobile because I'm getting a great price, I'm getting a great deal, I'm getting a great, great service, a great product, but at the same time, I'm supporting a, a worthy cause, the most worthy cause, the pro-life cause. So it's a win, win, win all the way down the line. So do yourself a favor uh, and call Charity Mobile at 1-877-474-3662. That's 1-877-474-3662 or chat with them online at charitymobile.com. Okay, after a leaked slide from an employee training course at the Goodyear Topeka plant went viral, revealing a discriminatory policy that allows Black Lives Matter and LGBT shirts and apparel, but not Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, the media has been scrambling to come up with some sort of excuse for their new favorite tire company. They're especially determined to defend Goodyear now that President Trump has stepped into the fray to voice his entirely justified objection to a company that allows expressions of support for a radical, violent Marxist organization, but no expressions of support for law enforcement uh, or even all lives in general. After supporting the boycott calls on Twitter, Trump was asked about it during a press conference, and here's how that went. Mr. President, I want to ask you about your tweet earlier today on Goodyear. It was essentially calling for a boycott on Goodyear tires. Do you want the federal government to stop buying and using Goodyear product as well? And is there well, anything I'm not happy with Goodyear because what they're doing is playing politics. And the funny thing is the people that work for Goodyear, I can guarantee you I poll very well with all of those great workers in Goodyear. And uh, when they say that you can't have Blue Lives Matter, you can't show a blue line. You can't wear a MAGA hat. But you can have other things that are Marxist in nature. Uh, there's something wrong with the top of Goodyear. And what the uh, radical left does is they make it impossible for people to do business if they're Republican or if they're conservative. They put out all sorts of effort. Uh, don't shop there. They do th vicious things. Not so different than what you saw on the streets of Portland two nights ago. What kind of boycott do you envision? Oh, I don't know. That's up to people. But I wouldn't recommend it. If they, if they want to hold political speech, if they want to let you not do what everybody's doing, if they want to wear a MAGA hat or if they want to wear a blue life, you know what blue lives matter, right? That's policemen and women. Uh, that's a terrible thing. That's a terrible thing. So they're using their power over these people. And these people want to wear whatever it is that we're talking about. You know that. Now, Goodyear has issued a clarification, which, after sifting through the obfuscating jargon, is actually not a clarification at all, less is it an apology. So here's the statement in full. I'm going to read the entire thing to you, uh, just so you know that I'm not trying to take stuff out of context. So bear with me. This is the entire statement from Goodyear. This is what they have to say in their defense. And the, and the media has, uh, has, has, has you know, passed along the statement saying that it sort of puts everything to rest. This is what they say. Yesterday, Goodyear became the focus of a conversation that created some misconceptions about our policies and our company. For those not aware, a widely circulated image sparked a strong reaction, and we wanted to take the opportunity to provide some important context to the visual 
and uh, our policies. Uh, they continue. First, the visual in question was not created or distributed by Goodyear Corporate. Notice the wording there. We'll get back to that. Nor was it part of a diversity training course. To be clear, on our longstanding corporate policy, Goodyear has zero tolerance for any form of harassment or disc discrimination. To enable a work environment th free of those, we ask that associates refrain from workplace expressions in support of political campaigning or any candidate or political party. Apparently, it doesn't include Marxist political organizations, as well as similar forms of advocacy that fall outside the scope of racial justice and equity issues. So those are the only issues you're allowed to talk about, but there's a problem there, which we will also get to. Second, they continue, we appreciate the diverse viewpoints of all of our more than 60,000 associates, which are at the heart of many of the policies we establish. Fostering an inclusive, respectful workplace is important to establish teamwork and build culture, which is another reason we ask associates not to engage in political campaigning of any kind in the workplace, Bless us for Black Lives Matter. That's me talking, not them. For any candidate, candidate uh, party, or political organization. Third and finally, Goodyear has always wholeheartedly supported both equality and law enforcement and will continue to do so. These are not mutually exclusive. I agree. You're the one, Goodyear, who said that it was. Uh, they continue, we have heard that from some of you that believe Goodyear is anti-police after reacting to the visual. Nothing could be further from the truth, and we have the utmost appreciation for the vital work police do on behalf of our shared community. This can't be said strongly enough. Okay. So the slide was not created or distributed by Goodyear Corporate, and it's not part of a diversity training class. That is a far cry from denying that it exists or that it accurately reflects their policy. The rest of the statement would only seem to confirm, in so many words, that employees are only permitted to voice certain approved views on certain approved issues. Now, audio from the training session at the Topeka plant has been leaked to WIBW, the local uh, news channel there in Topeka. And this would seem to put all doubt to rest. According to the audio, employees are instructed that they may, quote, express their views on social justice or, or inequity or equity issues such as Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ pride on their face covering shirts or wristbands. They are informed that such expression is, quote, approved and in accord with the, quote, zero tolerance policy. However, any associate who wears anything that says, quote, all blue or white lives matter will be deemed as having acted inappropriately. All right, here, listen, listen for yourself. Pride on their face covering shirts or wristbands, that will be deemed approved because it complies with zero tolerance stand. However, if any associate wears all blue or white lives matter shirts or face covering, covering that will be not appropriate. The unidentified speaker says the rules were created to make a better work environment. There's rules now around what you can wear. Um, let's try to comply with these so that way, uh, you know, everybody feels good in this, this factory. I want to make sure, guys, think about what we do in this factory, right? We all work together to make tires. That's what we do. That's what we get paid to do. So let's continue to do that and do the right thing keep this place uh, what it's always been, a good place to work. Based on the policy, the, the, or based on the audio there, the policy is considerably worse than first reported. I doubt that it's legal for an employer to tell workers they may express pride in one race, but not the other. In fact, let me correct that. I'm, I'm, I'm all but certain that it's not legal. This is by definition racial discrimination, and racial discrimination in the workplace is banned at every level of government everywhere, local, state, feds. Now, the, uh, the shameless hypocrites in media who have previously claimed that cancel culture is a myth insist that those of us who object to this grotesque, explicit discrimination are participating in cancel culture. CNN declared in an article that President Trump has embraced cancel culture by speaking out against Goodyear. MSNBC liked that talking point. They adopted it as well. Uh, in their headlines, alleged news anchor Don Lemon lashed out at Trump, calling him the biggest snowflake of them all and a hypocrite when it comes to cancel culture. And for good measure, he's also a bigot and a racist. Listen. We should point out the presidential limo Don is equipped with Goodyear tires. and The company has a longstanding relationship with the Secret Service and the U.S. military. What do you make of this call to boycott in a big American company? Well, two things. The president is, he likes to call people snowflakes and names. He's the biggest snowflake of them all. And we should mention, I should mention, he has criticized me, he's criticized you, he's criticized my colleagues, he's called for the cancellation uh, of CNN, and he tried to get involved in the AT&T merger. So he is a hypocrite when it comes to cancel culture. Number two, it's because he is 
he's afraid, Anderson, that he is about to be canceled and canceled by the voting public, uh, the American people. So I think, listen, we shouldn't be surprised that this president is a hypocrite. We shouldn't be surprised that he is making something political that's not. We shouldn't be surprised that he's a bigot. He's a bigot. He's a racist. He's a hypocrite. Those aren't opinions. Those are facts. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, don't worry. You know, a news anchor can say all of that. He hasn't forfeited his objectivity because we're informed these charges are not opinions, but rather facts. Well, all right, then it's all good. Speaking of hypocrisy, though, we don't need to strain very hard to imagine how the likes of CNN, MSNBC, Don Lemon, everyone else on the left would react if Goodyear or any other company instituted a policy in the reverse. If the rules allowed for all lives matter and blue lives matter, but explicitly banned black lives matter, every single person currently defending Goodyear and mocking us as snowflakes for criticizing them would be convulsing with rage. And if, I shudder to even imagine, Goodyear had said that white lives matter is acceptable and black lives matter is not, can you imagine? All of these same people would be accusing the company of committing a hate crime and calling for it to be disbanded by the government, and you know it. And those would be the most reasonable and measured responses. We can also assume that a few Goodyear locations would right now be lying in smoldering ruins, and the looters would have a stash of tires to go along with their burgeoning collection of stolen shoes and purses. There is no denying this. Again, we all know how it would go. Yet we're supposed to shrug at discrimination in the other direction, if not applaud it. That, that is really the expectation. There is no real justification offered for any of this. No reason, no defense, at least not a coherent or persuasive yet one. It's just how it goes. Yes, you peon. The rules say that certain races can express pride. Others can't. Certain races can announce that their lives matter. Others can't. Anti-discrimination policies apply to certain races, not others. Racism is not okay in one direction, but it is in the other. You peon, you rube, just accept it. We're told. Follow the rules. We can't explain them to you anyway because you're too stupid to understand. Just be a good boy and do as you're told. Here's a pat on the head. And and Goodyear is getting their pat on the head for being a good little boy. For dutifully adopting racism and calling it anti-racism. For banning diversity in the name of promoting diversity. For taking a position that only a lunatic could really believe. Namely, that declaring allegiance with a Marxist political organization is non-political while expressing support for law enforcement or simply for life universally is political. For that, they get their pat on the head. And not much more, because pats on the head don't equal customers in the door. And they've just sacrificed the latter for the former. They're far from the first to make that mistake, and I'm sure they won't be the last. Look, it's very simple for me. I am not going to play along with this game. You want me to accept or pretend at least to accept that all of this is okay and understandable and somehow necessary to heal racial wounds or whatever. No, I won't. You damned hypocrites, you absolute frauds, you clowns. No. One rule, one standard for everyone. That's how I'm going to live and and that's the expectation I will have of everybody else. Goodyear then is guilty of both racial and ideological discrimination, and nothing will ever make that okay. It's that simple. Let's go to five headlines. Let me tell you first about policy genius before we get into five headlines. Uh, your, 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 your loved ones, you got to think about the situation they're going to be in if you happen to, you know, kick the bucket, croak, as they say, uh, without having life insurance. Think about the situation they're going to be in. With everything going on right now, a lot of people are asking if it's even possible to buy life insurance at all. And the answer is yes. It's still easy to shop for life insurance. Not only can you do it, it's easy to do it. And if you have loved ones, depending on your income, you probably should get to that right now. Uh, right now, you could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies when you're shopping for a policy that could last for a decade or more. Uh, those savings really, really start to add up. What is Policy Genius? Well, it's an insurance marketplace. It's built and backed by a team of industry experts. And here's how it works. Step one, head to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need. Step two, apply for your lowest price. Step three, the Policy Genius will handle all the paperwork and red tape from there. So really easy, one, two, three. Uh, on your part, you know, on your end, Policy Genius is going to do most of the work for you. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance insurance company. So if you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they're going to take care of everything for you. 
uh, this is this is the the time I think if you if you have life insurance on your to do list, cross it off, take care of it. It won't take you long. You're going to save a lot of money, and you're going to be protecting your family. So if you need life insurance, head to PolicyGenius.com right now to get started. You could save fifteen hundred dollars or more by comparing quotes on their marketplace. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. All right. Um, Let me go to my headlines if I can. Here we go. Number one, another night of the DNC convention, which which, uh, does come to an end tonight. And I'm really excited to be hosting the watch party uh, for that tonight on All Access. We'll we'll, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Well, in fact, I'll just tell you right now, All Access Live, uh, you can can sign up for that. Um, It's our most exclusive membership tier over the Daily Wire is All Access. You go to dailywire.com slash Walsh right now, get 20% off All Access with, with a coupon code ACCESS. But tonight at 8.45 p.m., we will be streaming the um, last night of the DNC convention. It's going to be a big watch party, big celebration. So we're celebrating that it's ending, so make sure to tune in for that. Anyway, last night Obama spoke, Kamala Harris spoke, and um, a lot of people are talking about those speeches for some reason. What those people don't realize, apparently, is that all speeches from all politicians are lame and uninteresting. Like, have, have you ever, so anytime there's a political speech and people are reacting to it in this big way, making a big deal of it, as people are with Obama's speech, you know, but ha- have you ever in your life actually, and maybe there's something wrong with me, so I'm going to ask you, have you ever heard a, a, a political speech in which something was said that made you go, oh, wow, that's a great insight. I never thought of it like that. In, in your entire life, have you ever heard a political speech that had a moment like that? I never have, and I've heard a lot of them. I've heard non-politicians give talks and speeches like that, but I've never heard that from a politician ever. So political, political speeches are always telling you everything you already know and want to hear, or at least what one side or the other wants to hear, but packaging it in a smoother and more eloquent way, which, you know, there's a skill involved in that, but... But uh, there's, there's just, there's, I, I, the way people react to political speeches sometimes, I think, is there something wrong with me that I don't see it? Because I listen to that and I say, oh yeah, well, it just sounds like every other speech I've ever heard from a politician. Nothing special there. Uh, so we're going to skip over most of that. But I want to talk instead about the biggest speech of the night from a non-politician, uh, the mega star, I'm a huge fan myself, Billy Eilash, was at the convention to perform. And Eilash, despite being only 13, 14 years old, decided to begin her performance with a little political lecture for us, which I, which this, I, I did hear quite a lot in this that, that I saw, thought was v- valuable insight. And uh, here it is, listen. You don't need me to tell you things are a mess. Donald Trump is destroying our country and everything we care about. We need leaders who will solve problems like climate change and COVID, not deny them. Leaders who will fight against systemic racism and inequality. And that starts by voting for someone who understands how much is at stake. Someone who's building a team that shares our values. It starts with voting against Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. Silence is not an option and we cannot sit this one out. We all have to vote like our lives and the world depend on it because they do. The only way to be certain of the future is to make it ourselves. Please register, please vote. Yeah, uh, really really good stuff there. Is she standing in a forest, by the way? That's what I couldn't, the whole time I'm trying to figure out, it sounds like there's crickets in the background and she's in a, like a foggy, misty forest. They gave everybody else sound stages and studios and they made her record in a haunted forest. That seems unsafe, frankly. Is this the first address ever given from a haunted forest at a political convention? That's what I want to know. That would be good trivia. I think it might be. If I remember correctly, though, we should note, uh, Newt Gingrich did deliver some remarks from a serial killer's shed during the 1992 Republican convention. So a similar kind of idea, but this time they're out in the forest. Um, anyway, that was, that was good. And, and really, I'm rethinking all of my positions now after reflecting on what Betsy Irish had to say there. Uh, as I said, big, big fan of her, um, of her music. All right, let's go to number two. I guess I lied, so forgive me for that. I said I wouldn't play any of the p- politician speeches. On second thought, I will play just this one little snippet. I didn't completely lie, I guess, because I said that speeches aren't interesting and they don't, they don't contain anything that I haven't heard before, which is absolutely true of this. But still, it's notable, so listen. They understand that in this democracy, the commander-in-chief 
does not use the men and women of our military who are willing to risk everything to protect our nation as political props to deploy against peaceful protesters on our own soil. Yes, yeah, so that would be Barack Obama, former president, supposedly above it all, not mean and nasty like old Trump, the adult in the room, right? Yes, that Barack Obama, and he's making excuses there for Antifa, making excuses for rioters that have left city blocks in ruins and killed dozens of people, calling them peaceful. That's what we get from, from Obama, who's just so above. He doesn't, he doesn't do all the petty politics. All he's doing is excusing this dangerous group of people that have you know, been killing and destroying for, for months now. Number three, speaking of making excuses, check out these tweets from a guy by the name of Andrew Sampson. Um, he's uh, in the tweet. He's responding to someone who says that they were that they, their home was broken into. And Andrew, the compassionate and empathetic man, says in response, "Because Bay Area folks refuse to pay taxes, push homeless shelters out of their neighborhoods, fight against social programs that help the local populace suffering from addiction, and participate in gentrification, which is skyrocketing up real estate prices." That's the reason he gives for the uh, for the for the for the break-in. Then he continues, of course, there is the entitlement and privilege that comes with all of that. Someone breaking into your house should make you question why they felt that was their only choice and how the system failed them. Translation, you have no right to be upset if your home is broken into. Uh, it's partially your fault for living in the neighborhood, and also it's the system's fault. So it's your fault, the system's fault. It's not the fault of the person who chose to you know, move their legs up to your door open the, the, the door or the window or whatever and come in. It's not their fault. It's everyone else's fault. Now, if you don't want your home broken into, you're entitled. It's probably a good time now to mention that Andrew Sampson is on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, meaning he's young and rich. And now it's also, also a good time to mention that the vast majority of break-ins obviously happen in low-income areas, not surprisingly. In low-income areas, that's where many of the robbers and burglars live. Um, that's also where the easy targets are. Working class, low income households are not going to have armed security, probably won't have cameras, dogs. They might have one dog, but you know, they're not going to have trained security dogs and so on. So this rich SOB is sitting in his, in his safe, large, protected home telling you that you're entitled if you want to be as safe as him. That's what's going on here. And you see how this works. This compassion for criminals is really just a total lack of compassion for victims. This is not. This is the absence of compassion. These are people who don't give a damn about the victims of crime, and they package that sociopathic indifference and selfishness in a nice little coating of faux compassion for criminals. Uh, last note here. I don't know if you've ever suffered a break-in before. My family has. It was a long time ago. I don't remember it. I was very young. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. But my mom was home when someone came into the house, probably looking to steal something, presumably. Uh, I don't know if they actually did take anything before running off, but, but, but here's the point. Nobody was physically hurt. Nothing of value, as far as I know, was taken. And yet, this is a highly traumatic experience. To have a stranger in your home violating your safety and security in that way to feel all of a sudden unsafe and vulnerable in your own home, that's a terrifying experience. It's not a small thing, okay? It's not the kind of thing, like if you wake up in the middle of the night and there's someone in your living room, that's not the kind of thing that you just, oh, you know, hey, the system failed him, it's all right. I'm going to go back to bed. Hey, take what you want, okay? You want, you want a glass of water or anything? Hey, no problem, okay? So I'm sleep on the couch, great. No, you don't do that. You, th that's, that's not the kind of thing you brush off. Uh, and Andrew Sampson wouldn't brush it off either. That's the attitude he has for everyone else. He says, ah, shake it off, rub some dirt on it, get over it, you'll be fine, you sissy. And then he retreats behind his locked gate with the uh, motion-activated cameras. That's the way it goes. Number four, reading from the Daily Wire, Sweden's top infectious disease expert warns that believing face masks will stem the spread of COVID-19 is very dangerous. Anders Tegnell, chief um, epidemiologist at Sweden's public health agency, basically the equivalent of U.S. Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci, an immunologist, says there's no proof masks actually limit the spread of the virus. This is what he says. Uh, it is very dangerous to believe face masks would change the game when it comes to COVID-19. Face masks can be a complement to other things when other things are safely in place. But to start with having face masks and then think you can crowd your buses or your shopping malls, that's definitely a mistake. Uh, and then he goes on from there. Like, and this just, this just shows again how there's an actual discussion to be had here 
about the efficacy of fa- face masks and how they should be used, whether they should be used and who should be using them and in what context they should be used. This is something we should really be talking about. But of course, like with everything else, once it is settled, meaning that, you know, the media and the elites have decided that this is what it's going to be, then no more discussion is allowed. Number five, finally, this is good stuff. Uh, Jane Lavender, assistant editor for the Daily Mirror, tweets an image, a photo from a book written in the 50s, giving women advice on how to get a man. And I thought, you know, in the 50s, they really got it. They understood. They did, especially on issues related to the sexes. Uh, so, so, so they, they, they understood. So I'm going to go through this together. We'll all go through this together. And, um, we'll just see if you're a single woman who, uh, you know, is, is looking for a man, then I think this might be useful for you. So what we have here is one page. I don't know if she puts up, no, yeah, it's just the one page and it's actually 129 ways to get a husband. And here we have, you know, just, uh, just, you know, 20 or 30 of them. So let's go through a few of them here. Okay says, uh, number 14, be nice to everybody. They may have an eligible brother or son. Good advice. Okay, no problem there. Get a government job overseas. Mm, I, You know, these days I'm not so sure about that. I guess it depends on... I don't know if I would think of that as a way to necessarily meet someone. I guess you could, but it really depends on where you are. Uh, volunteer for jury duty. Is jury duty really a place for that kind of fraternizing? I, I, I would like to think that it isn't. Um, be friendly to ugly men. Handsome is as handsome does. Good advice. Tell your friends that you're interested in getting married. Don't keep it a secret. Yeah, that, that's a big one. Tell everybody. Uh, write, wear it on a shirt. You know, maybe get a shirt made up. I'm interested in getting married. Put up a billboard sign in your, in your, uh, in your community with your face. I'm desperate to get married. Something like that. That's going to advertise and, uh, the suitors are going to show up to your door, I think. Maybe not to your door. You probably wouldn't want that. But I like this one. Get lost at football games. It's great. I have been lost uh, at football games, and I didn't meet any eligible men. I can I can tell you when I was when I was lost. Uh, mainly because I was ashamed that I was lost at a football game. Don't take a job in a in a company run largely by women. Okay, here's a good one. All right, now we finally got down to business here, so to speak. Number twenty. Don't take a job in a company run largely by women. Uh, y- y- you might argue, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm saying this. I'm not saying that I'm not saying this either, but someone might say that that is actually good advice in general for everybody across time and space. Some might say that. I've, I've heard some say that. Some say it, some don't say it. That's all. Um, get a job demonstrating fishing tackle in a sporting goods store. Demonstrating fishing tackle in a sporting... This is written by, see, at first I thought this has to be a list written by a man based on the advice, but this advice here tells me this is a list written by a woman because this is written by someone who's never been in a sporting goods store. I've I've been in many sporting goods stores in my time. I've spent way too much time and money in them. In fact, an embarrassing amount of time and money. Uh, I've never seen someone there like demonstrating the fishing tackle. How would you even do that? Are they going to have like a, a wading, a baby pool? And they're going to have the jig on there and they're, they're casting in. And I, what does that, what would that even look like? And frankly, call me sexist. Uh, if I was asking for someone to demonstrate it, I prefer if it was a man demonstrating a fishing tackle. This kind of takes me back. I went to a cigar shop not long ago. And uh, it was, it was act, I, I, again, many, many cigar shops in my day. Again, an embarrassing amount of time and money spent in them. First time in my life I've ever seen uh, a woman that was there in explaining all the different cigars and, and tell which, hey, she has every right to, perfectly fine. I'm progressive, so I, I was fine with that. But there was a, a part of me, you know, it, it, there was, it, it was a part of me taken aback by it. That's all I'm saying. Not in a negative way, okay? So I'm thinking it would be the same thing with a woman demonstrating fishing tackle. So I don't know about this one. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. There's, any other, there's a lot of advice here. We won't go through all of this. But carry a hat box. <laughs> What? How would that help? What is a hat box? A box with a hat, I guess. See, this is how. This is why I've got the the seventy five IQ. Uh, so you just carry a ba- uh, box with a hat around. Is it a ca- conversation starter? Like a man's got to walk up to you. What's, what do you got there? Oh, a hat box. Oh, you got a hat box. What? What do you keep in that? A hat. Oh. 
Well, see you later. See, that's how I would see that conversation going. I don't know if that's really going to work. Uh, and then, uh, you know, oh, stand in a corner and cry softly. Chances are good that he'll come over to find out what's wrong. You know what? That's that of all of this. That's probably the best advice on this entire list. Um, and not bad. Some good stuff there. It's, at least it's it's it, look. Some of it's some of it's an, antiquated. At least a lot of it is better than probably the advice you get these days. Uh, you know, if you listen to a song like, for example, WAP. You know, I think this advice is probably a little bit more applicable in your everyday life, though not much more. Okay, let's go to our daily cancellation. Now, for our daily cancellation today, we're going to look at a story that actually makes me angry, if you can believe it. I know it doesn't seem like me to be angry about something, but I am uh, for a change of pace. We're going to be canceling the cancel mob that came for a guy named John Folk. Last name spelled F-O-C-K-E. I'm going to pronounce it Folk because that's the safest way to go. I'm not actually sure if that's the real pronunciation. Now, um, anyone inclined to believe the absurd spin that, as many left-leaning media outlets have claimed, cancel culture is nothing but a myth concocted by bitter conservatives, should consider the story of the unfortunate John Folk. The, uh, the announcer for the Charlotte Hornets has seen his life torn to shreds in the last few days. He's indefinitely suspended from his job. He's been condemned and ridiculed all over social media. Major publications and, 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 and national media personalities are accusing him of bigotry and worse. All because his thumbs landed on the wrong letter while composing a tweet. This was during a, a, a game between the Denver Nuggets and the Utah Jazz. John, Actually, I'm just going to call him John. We'll just go with John. Safest of all. John sent out a tweet about the action on the court. And the tweet said, shot making in the Jazz Nuggets game is awesome. Murray and Mitchell going back and forth. What a game. That was the tweet. And the problem was the typo on the word Nuggets, which through two errant twitches of the finger, came out as the N-word. Now, John deleted the tweet, fervently apologized for it. It was too late. His job was gone within hours. There was near unanimous agreement on social media that either he wrote the N-word on purpose or his phone auto-corrected to that word because he types it so often in text messages and emails that it programmed itself. Headlines in publications like USA Today trumpeted the news. You know, a guy named John Folk tweeted a racial slur, they said. ESPN pers personality Mark Jones suggested that um, his phone corrected itself to the N-word because Folk had, quote, written it a ton of times and trained it that way. And lengthy, uh, a lengthy Yahoo News editorial implied that John had intentionally written it, saying that the claim of a typo, quote, strains credulity, and that the tweet signals that, quote, he might have a problem with black people. So the scalp has been claimed, a life left in smoldering ruins, and the vengeful mob once again dances in celebration around the ashes, all because of a typo. Speaking of straining credulity, it is the absolute height of absurdity to claim that this man would intentionally tweet the N-word in some sort of maniacal act of professional suicide. The typo explanation, especially considering that the R and T and U and I keys are right next to each other on your phone's keypad, is significantly more plausible than the self-immolation theory that you're getting from the media. The idea that the phone had programmed itself with a racial slur as an autocorrect is similarly ridiculous. As far as I'm aware, smartphones will, will not autocorrect to profanity unless you go into your settings and specifically install those words as options. I sincerely doubt that John, an NBA announcer who live tweets NBA games, would have done that. Is it really so impossible to believe that this was an, an, nothing but an innocent mistake made by a man who was merely trying to send an excited tweet about a basketball game that he was watching? In the whole history of people typing the word nuggets into their smartphone, is it impossible to believe that eventually, by a roll of the, the dice, someone somewhere is going to make that mistake? No, it's not. Not for any honest or rational person anyway. So why the performative outrage? Why the gleeful attempt to destroy the life of some obscure regional NBA broadcaster nobody's ever heard of? Well, because this is cancel culture. It comes in several different forms, but here it is at its most pernicious and loathsome. Sure, sometimes the mob tries to cancel high-profile people like J.K. Rowling when they voice a really objectionable opinion like biological sex exists or some other blasphemy, but it's especially toxic when it comes for the obscure and the powerless and devours them for the sheer pleasure of the exercise. Cancel culture is, 
by definition, petty, cruel, vindictive, and arbitrary. It is also entirely false in its motives and its claims. The cancel culture mob is never genuinely angry, never seeking real justice. Of course, I call it arbitrary, but it's only arbitrary in the sense that the penalty bears no relation to the alleged infraction. The victims selected are not arbitrary. John, as a random white guy who committed an accidental racial flub, is the perfect target. We know, of course, that if, that if he was non-white and had actually intentionally tweeted slurs about white people and admitted that it was intentional, there would be no mob coming for him at all, and he would still have his job. So the victim selection here is not uh, completely arbitrary, but it is, again, petty, cruel, vindictive, and also hypocritical, of course. It's funny that the people who called for this dude to be fired are largely the same ones who'd insist that rioters and looters and other violent criminals should be given grace and patience and their actions ought to be understood in context. Burn a house down, loot a store, assault a random pedestrian, break into someone's house like we just heard. That's deserving of our understanding. In that case, we, we should consider the overall context of, of the actions. But accidentally hit the wrong keys with your thumb, death penalty. You're finished. That's how it goes. Because it's all a game to these people. In fact, I found it quite appropriate that the first tweet I read when I typed John Folk's name into the Twitter search bar yesterday, this was the first tweet. It said, the John Folk story is hilarious. Fire that man. Yes, how hilarious. Fire him. Wreck his life. There's no reason to do it. He doesn't deserve it. But hey, it's kind of funny if you're a sociopath. And, you know, what else is there to do on a Monday? You might as well. So for that reason, uh, this particular mob is yet again canceled. And we'll leave it there today. Uh, join me again for the All Access Watch Party tonight, DNC convention. Otherwise, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. President Trump addresses QAnon. A New York Times editor doesn't even Google the man he smears, and Goodyear has a bad day. Get it? Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Michael Knowles Show.